Hi folks, it's Dorian here. Uh, I'm going to show this prototype tool I've had uh, kicking around for a few years that I haven't really directed a lot of public attention to. And I'm going to demonstrate it by stepping through the rationale for its own creation. Uh, it all started out when I uh, needed to design a protocol uh, for getting semantic web data uh, off a web page and into, uh, into a database on a web server. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to do that was because uh, I was trying to create a quick and dirty web application uh, to do exactly that, a semantic web application, and I needed a way to uh, get it in. And uh, I was uh, not going to use JavaScript. I was very intent on uh, keeping it as simple as possible. So I went this route, and uh, there was a rationale behind that as well, which was that the process of uh, entering data, entering RDF data, semantic web data, is incredibly tedious, especially when you're using UUIDs uh, to identify the nodes because you have to type them and, uh, or either that or cut and paste them. And it's an extremely slow process if you're just typing the data directly into a file. And of course, the reason why you would do that, uh, use UUIDs, I mean, is because the trying to figure out a layout for a URL pass, if you're just going to use regular uh, linked data, semantic web, what have you, uh, is also an onerous process because you have to figure out what you're going to call things. And so when you use UUIDs, you can separate the problem of recording the information from the problem of naming it. So that brings us back again uh, to the protocol, and that's uh, how this guy got started. So, so once I made the protocol implementation, I was like, well, what am I going to test it with? I needed a complete vocabulary so that I could write an app against it, because the protocol is completely generic, and it uh, doesn't do anything other than what you tell it to. So the answer there was to uh, use uh, this thing called an IBIS uh, vocabulary that defines a data specification. So that uh, so I put these two things together. So IBIS, uh, issue-based information system. This is a thing that's about 50 years old. Uh, it was uh, the project of a couple of uh, management information systems uh, professors from Berkeley uh, in the late 60s. And the purpose of it is uh, effectively design rationale and problem solving. You have uh, three concepts or three classes of entity. Uh, you've got issues, which are things in the world that you want to do something about. You've got positions, what to do about them. Uh, and then you have arguments, uh, which are why or, or why not. The issues, positions, and arguments are connected together by semantic relations of various kinds, as you can see here. And so what I'm basically showing you is the design rationale for this tool. The bet was that it would be useful to uh, put these two elements together, the protocol and the vocabulary, and make an app. And it did, indeed, turn out to be useful. So useful, in fact, this thing, 60 years on, is still a prototype because it's been, uh, been too busy using it instead of developing it. The idea is you would use a tool like this contemporaneously while you're working on a project so that you could record the process of making a thing to make a thing to make a thing to make a thing, kind of like uh, Theseus in the Minotaur scenario, letting out uh, a little bit of string from a spool or otherwise you would use it to front load everything you know uh, about the project uh, so that you can eliminate bad ideas up front. Uh, in this case, I have done the Julia Child thing and prepared a bunch of uh, elements for, for a demo, but you could see this being something that you would populate incrementally. So to oscillate back from what's being represented on the app to the app itself, a sensible pattern in semantic web apps is to put web pages into one-to-one -one correspondence to subjects in the graph. Now, what I mean by subject 
is that RDF is an arc labeled directed graph of the form subject predicate object. So it's simple enough to say one subject equals one web page. As for the predicates and objects, those are what we put on the web page. So the next part of the pattern is to normalize the semantic relations of the immediate neighbors and group them by predicate. You know, by normalize, I mean if a link points into the subject, we flip it around to point out by rewriting it as its inverse. So generalizes and specializes at the bottom of the page here are inverses of each other. And there are other inverses too. The inverse mappings are a feature of a given vocabulary. So I wrote them when I designed this IVIS vocabulary. And indeed, one of the reasons why I ultimately abandoned any meaningful development on this prototype is because I had to replicate these inverse mappings in the app and the entire point of the technology is that you get the engine to do that for you which the programming language I wrote this in didn't have. The general pattern however is sound. Each web page represents a sort of patch of the graph. You have the literal content of the subject itself represented as well as links to its neighbors. What we need to do now is differentiate them somehow. Now the way to do this is by taking the graph statements and embedding them into the web page itself using a technology called RDFA. And that is RDF embedded into attributes of XML or HTML. From there we can use CSS to color code the different classes and properties and, and elements. Later prototypes addressing other aspects of this generic technique use the same embedded metadata to rearrange the actual structure of the presentation layer and compose complex pages from these Lego-like pieces. So by contrast this prototype is actually quite rudimentary. I could talk for hours about the general technique and this particular implementation of it, but I'm going to cover one more thing before I wrap up for now. And that is that we need a bigger uh, sense of the orientation of this immediate uh, topological neighborhood. So the answer here is, of course, to visualize a larger patch in the graph, which what we call a partial spanning tree. And of course, this automatically raises the question of how. So I considered something like D3, but figured that would introduce having to figure out a reasonable way of transmitting the information of both the content and the palette into the D3 renderer. And at the time, that felt like a digression. Moreover, at the time, D3 only had the force-directed model, and I became sympathetic to a guy named Shrinsky uh, who was arguing that force-directed graph representations look like hairballs, because they do. So ultimately, the deciding factors were the palette and what I could implement relatively painlessly uh, just to get some visualization or other up and running. And so this led me to generate the visualizations in SVG with the same embedded RDFA. I ended up initially trying out one of Shrensky's designs called hive plot and this turned out to be totally unusable because the aspect ratio got out of whack when you started adding data so the thing would either get really tall or really wide depending on uh, what you put into it and this was totally unusable for a dynamic representation like this luckily Shvinsky had an earlier design I could co-opt which he calls Circos, which is more or less what you see here today. Now, I consider this visualization to be a stopgap, and I have an idea for a better one, but as I already said, I'm not putting any more significant effort into this particular prototype. It has already done so much more than it has ever needed to. So there are other things I could discuss, like the concept scheme, a uh, feature I rather hastily added to the corner over here, or how the system was initially conceived by its inventors to be collaborative. These are going to have to wait for another 
installment. I want to reassert though that these kinds of apps are tiny. This whole thing is about 3,000 lines of code and most of that is bookkeeping that would not be present in future systems uh, and the graphics rendering it takes up most of it. All of the power in the system is embedded in the data itself. Each of these paragraphs correspond to the data that you see on each web page and the whole thing can be lifted out of this app and plopped into another one which is ultimately what I intend to do. You can see this thing up at ibis.makethingsmakesense.com and play around with it for yourself. That's all for now. Thanks for your attention.